Привет, comrades, and welcome to the good ship Smirch Spionam. <laughs> we are the flagship submarine of not just the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union that exists exclusively in the heads of white American liberals. <laughs> <laughs> I am Captain Devon. I am directing the state-of-the-art submarine to the east coast of America, where we will use mind control powers to make them elect a fucking Cheeto. <laughs> <laughs> Joining me is, uh, um... Comrade Ellis, Comrade uh, so I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to figure out what rank you are. Your uniform is frankly cons quite confusing <laughs> to me. <laughs> Ca Cap Captain Major Lieutenant Commander. Right. Right. Uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, also with me is Hype Lieutenant Abigail. She has the most important job on this vessel. She stands on the bridge and breathlessly says, they will give you the order of Lenin for this comrade whenever <laughs> any decision is made, no matter how minor. Привет, товарищи! Мы снова играем в шкам в снасным старым противником в NHS gender identity clinic. And uh, and finally, sat at the radar desk, masterfully isolating the sound of an enemy vessel from the background noise. It is me vacuuming, bumping the microphone, <laughs> refusing to turn the radio off. His comrade producer, Nate Bethay. Yeah, hello. I was very confused when seeing Tim Curry's face in this film because I remember him wearing a dress in a Rocky Horror Picture Show and I got excited in a way I could not explain, but it made me very angry. <laughs> <laughs> you will receive the rosette of Kronstein for this, Captain. <laughs> Here you have defected to this glorious imaginary nation from Pig Dog America. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Привет, доброе утро, and welcome to a bonus episode of Kill James Bond. Well, as you may have guessed from our delightful cold open, we are watching. We are going back at 3.22 a.m. for more old Connery. In the form <laughs> of Hunt for Red October, a genuinely ah, good movie. So good. And also a genuinely good Game Boy game on the original yeah. black and white Game Boy, Ooh. which opened with a chip tune version of the USSR National Anthem. Holy now, shit. now there's your hauntology. So good. good. Yeah. Oh my God, we are going to get to the hauntology. Mm. Because it's my, it's my so contention, because this is based on a novel by Tom Clancy. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's my, it's right. my contention that Tom Clancy is the most important and least examined American cultural figure of his time. That sort of like end of Cold War, beginning of War on Terrorism thing. Uh, mm. I, I simply cannot stop thinking about the bit in one of the Tom Clancy novels where he puts a fucking American football in the hands of a dying terrorist. So he's like, this is a fucking pigskin, baby. Yes. You're not going to heaven. Yes. <laughs> it's incredible. T T Tom Clancy, perfect. who has wow. written about uh, the, the <laughs> real, K KGB agents trying to shoot the Pope, um, forming like private intelligence agencies with twins. The guy, uh, his recurring protagonist, Jack Ryan, who is in this, who starts in this in, as a CIA analyst and becomes president over the course of about 50 books. A Japanese guy does 9-11 to the Capitol. Tom Clancy books are wild. I, I was going to say, it's funny to me that, uh, that this, we were talking about this right after the 20th anniversary of 9-11 because I can recall the extent to which people in American news media, not just in popular culture, were sort of like, does Tom Clancy have some explanation? Like, not like he was responsible, but more like <laughs> they, were, they were really, really fixated on this idea that Tom Clancy must have known something important about like the workings of like the terrorist mind or whatever, oh, yeah. because, because Dead of Honor, his novel oh. about uh, the... Japanese guy kamikazeing the U.S. Capitol. Uh, people were like, "Well, 9/11 was kind of that, wasn't it?" Yeah, the guy, the guy accidentally <laughs> yeah, predicted 9/11, but for the wrong country. Um, but this was—I mean, so did the Super Mario Brothers movie. If you want to get Lord. into it, <laughs> Tom Clancy's Super Mario Brothers movie. No, but this was this oh, was no, Tom Clancy's good. first novel, *The Hunt for Red October*. Before this, he was just kind of like a a, a war nerd, something to which I can relate. Um, mm -hmm. he, he was a guy who had always wanted to be in the military and couldn't get in. Uh, bad eyesight, apparently. 
And so, lol. Yeah, and so he just kind of became he interested in what would now I guess be called like open source intelligence, but back then was called being a fucking nerd. Um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a, a lot of shit, uh, that came out of the military industrial complex got just published openly and got disseminated. You could buy and read like proceedings of, you know, such and such a society or a journal or whatever, and it'd be in there in like full color, but nobody really understood that. And so Tom Clancy, by reading this, developed this sort of reputation as like, oh, he knows a lot of shit about this. It's just like, um, it's the discussion Nate and I have had where every time you're like, well, how come you know this shit about the military? I'm like, well, autism is a developmental disorder. <laughs> primarily characterized. Have you considered writing a novel, Alice? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the gift that Tom Clancy has for highly sort of technical details. That's what distinguishes him. But he was incredibly popular. Like, Reagan read this book. Um, mm -hmm. He had a lot of readers in the CIA. Uh, and a lot of readers in the CIA who, again, just fully did not grasp how much of this stuff was in the public domain and were just like, how does he know this about us? <laughs> Bas ba exactly. Basically, uh, the secret to his success, literally the volume of Jane's that's yes. shown in the, in, in the establishing shot in Jack Ryan's London office or whatever, uh, that's it. Well, we publish this shit every year, but we didn't think anyone would actually be autistic enough to read it. <laughs> <laughs> And then yeah, I, 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 there are some along, details baby. in this before we start. There are some things, and I, I may pause as, as we're talking through certain things because there were some details for me as a uh, ground pounder who was supposed to do helicopter nerd shit periodically for my job. There are things in this that I was really impressed by the attention to detail that it made it into the movie. And I realized that the Navy was like, as I skimmed from Wikipedia, <laughs> the Navy thought this might be able to do for submarines what Top Gun did for uh, fighter pilots. Oh. Although I don't know if this film would really make me want to be on a submarine. Uh, and so, I think that there was obviously some technical assistance therein, but it's, it is very mm. interesting how much attention to detail there is in sort of like, even in kind of like prosaic ways, but like that would stop, you know, in a regular film would be like, oh, this magical thing we can do with magic. Mm. Whereas in real life, you kind of, you kind of in this film as like real life, you kind of encounter the technical limitations of a thing that can be done, but isn't necessarily easily doable mm -hmm. or even doable at all in outside of the best of circumstances. Or so crucially doable safely. As we see it, exactly, times. exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so true. so uh, I have so many good things to say about this film, and I'm excited to hear uh, our summary. Mm. Well, we start in the icy cold of glass of Russia, Holiani Inlet, <laughs> uh, where we see first shot of the movie, old Sean Connery. Uh, yeah, sorry, I think, frankly, we owe it to Sean Connery. To do one good old man Connery movie yeah, that isn't a yeah. Bond one. Yeah, it was between this and Indiana Jones, and this was more related to our whole mm -hmm. deal. Um, yeah, so Sean Connery is a uh, the commanding officer of a Soviet ballistic missile submarine, and uh, we see him talk to his his officers and like uh, his crew as they are leaving Russia, and the whole time. Uh, he and everyone else is speaking Russian. Now, you may remember oh, well. Sean Connery's Ohio Gajayamash, Oriental mm -hmm. Languages. Uh, That's right. His Russian, not better, I'll be honest. Yeah, it's about as good as the Russian that I spoke during the cold open, which is to say mainly gibberish. <laughs> uh, he, but hey, you know, he, uh, he tries. I mean, uh, Sam Neill, who is his executive officer, mm -hmm. his, his second in command, is his Russian is a lot better. And I'm always thrilled to see Sam Neill in any I, Me too. I love Sam Neill mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Every time he was on screen, I was going, hell yeah, Sam Neill. And every time he wasn't on screen, I was going, where is Sam Neill? Mm -hmm. Show mm -hmm. me him. Show me the boy. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile. Old man Connery voice. The American pig docks will have their day. <laughs> Mean Meanwhile, we get to see two of this film's three speaking female characters yes. in one scene come and That's go. That's right. We meet <laughs> Jack Ryan, a CIA Time analyst fancy, baby. <laughs> stationed in London, played by a, frankly, shockingly young Alec Baldwin. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, just, oh, truly. Literally just say goodbye to his wife and daughter. That's it. That's the whole role in this movie. Did he pick up who his, who his wife is played by? Uh, no, who is his wife? No. Gates McFadden, a.k.a. Dr. Crusher from, uh, from oh, Star Trek Enterprise. How did I, I miss thought... that? Oh, shit. If you're that kind of nerd, Dr. Crusher walks into the scene, has two lines in an English accent, and then leaves the movie. Huh. I was so... so there you go. I, I, I knew she looked familiar, but I absolutely mm -hmm. could not put my finger on it. 
There you go. Yeah. I wouldn't miss yeah, a Star Trek just, Next Generation detail like that. It's a, it's a perfect scene. Tom, Tom Clancy, sorry, Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> frankly, frankly, incredible that Al- this was Alec Baldwin. N- myself and my girlfriend, neither of us realized it was Alec Baldwin until right at the end when we were like, wait a fucking second. Mm, <laughs> because yeah. I've never seen him young. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But he's looking quite good. Fair point. He, yeah. has, he has a little interaction with his daughter, um, and then his wife walks into the scene and goes, Tell her to go to fucking bed. We've got to go now. And then that's the end of the scene. Yeah. And the, ma- the, the main thrust of this is that he has to, he's been called urgently to go from London to America. Uh, uh, the, f- the flight stewardess speaks to him. And yeah, that is and we the get last a time a little, woman in this movie speaks. We, we, we get a little Sorkin esque <laughs> moment where, in order to establish that really he's do. both smart and a little bit arrogant, uh, the, the, the flight attendant tells him, uh, well, like, he's trying to sleep and he can't sleep on the plane. And she she asks him about it, and he says, well, "I don't like the turbulence." And she, making conversation, says, "Turbulence." And Jack Ryan explains to a woman <laughs> who works on airplanes <laughs> what <laughs> turbulence is. It's so good. He like fully explains yeah. it, and her response is just like, "All right, yeah, she just try and sleep and anyway." Bye. The end of women. Turbulence. Solar radiation heats the Earth's crust. Warm air rises. Cooler descends. Turbulence. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, no more women. That's right. That's it, baby. <laughs> I, he he's literally like, yeah, you know, warm air rises, cold air falls. It creates turbulence. Turbulence. I don't like it. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, you fucking asshole. Uh, but yeah, but we establish that he doesn't like being in the air. Yes, mm-hmm. and he can't sleep on a plane. But he yeah. gets. He also just can't sleep in general. Yeah, he, he gets. He right. gets to the U.S. Uh, where he immediately is taken to CIA headquarters, and. Uh, I, I improve this movie by a full letter grade because it's got James L. Jones in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it fucking does. I, I'm not sure if yes, it's meant it to be like does. director of the CIA or like a uh, director of intelligence, but uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's Jack he's, Ryan's boss. He's, like, he's Jack Ryan's he's boss. Credited he's credited as deputy director of I the see, CIA. I see. <laughs> Vice Admiral James Greer. Yes, and he's. I mean, I, I love James L. Jones in anything. He's very cool in this film. He's very good. Get, yeah. the, get the drop here of James L. Jones saying, Big son of a bitch, please. Big son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he just delivers that What's line good? so weird. <laughs> it's yeah. so good. In reference to uh, a brand new submarine Shut that up. the Soviets uh, have the, just they, made. They, they have, achi- they have um, uh, obtained photographs of uh, a submarine called Red October being built. And this mm-hmm. is a ballistic missile submarine, a Typhoon class, but a variant of it that's larger that no one's ever seen before, and it has these strange sort of symmetric doors or hatches either side of the, mm-hmm. uh, the screws running longitudinally down the ship. And they don't know what it is, but it's it's just launched to sea, and they're like, hmm, we think maybe the Russians have developed something new. Because, of course, we're in the Cold War. Uh, this this yeah. film came out in uh, 1990. Yeah. And it's like, so, so in, we're set, still... Set in 84, yeah. though, yeah, because... Can Chernenko is still the right. uh, yeah. premier, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, mm. Yeah, so R- Ryan's job is to go and find out what these doors do. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, we cut to the Jack middle Ryan. of the North Atlantic. <laughs> Figure out what these fucking doors are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah work for the CIA, incredibly glamorous. You've seen this door? Uh, ask our door guy about this. Um, mm-hmm. We were... <laughs> Which is Sean very funny because he's, for, he's forced to go to the naval yard to meet the door guy, uh, his old friend, the door <laughs> guy, who explains doors to him. Yes. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's like him to the fucking airplane stewardess explaining turbulence. This guy is just mm. like, all right, so what a door is, is it lets you enter or exit yeah, it's, like, it's, like, it's like a wall, but you put it on a hinge or it slides. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you open it, the same thing's behind it every time, baby. a maybe. series of airplane jokes. But the thing is, the thing is, Jack, when you close that door, that space is still there. It doesn't disappear. <laughs> you can just open it back up again. It's still there. <laughs> Jack's like going, shit, it's but crazy. But before we see the door guy, yes. we, we have to go to sea. Yes, and uh, at sea, there are two submarines. There is the Red October, which we know about, uh, where mm. everybody is still speaking Russian to each other, and mm-hmm. the USS Dallas, which is a Los Angeles class yeah. uh, US submarine. Uh, and we see that there are uh, like their sonar crew. They're training a new guy, and they have mm-hmm. uh, a sonar operator. They have banter. 
Yeah, they have banners. Like, banner. The Russian submarines are so serious, but the American Navy, famously a chill and cool place to work, where everyone's like, hey, Jonesy, like, well, how's I, it I, going, I think, buddy? I think it's like... kind of the opposite, right? Like, I was also laughing at the way they do the Russian sub, which is uh, fully, like, you stand to attention for every officer who goes past mm-hmm. you. Everyone is wearing the <laughs> tunics buttoned all the way up. And Even it's... little things like the Russian submarine is darker on the inside yeah, yeah, than the yeah, yeah. And, like, yeah. It's like a slightly more, it's like a Klingon ship. It's so Un- unlike Tom Clancy, I won't pretend to have first-hand knowledge, but second-hand knowledge tells me that uh, the second hatches close, submarine crews tend to wear anything except uniform. Like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, yeah, yeah I believe so. I've, I've I've heard this uh, mostly in reference to the also great movie Das Boot. Uh, in which, like, a bunch of Nazi U-boat guys just wear, like, whatever shit they want. Which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway. So, well, it's, it'd be hot to wear the uniform all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it's, it's hot and it's crammed, all the air is, like, full of, like, gasoline and shit. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Um, so, we, we established that the USS Dallas has a sort of an ice-cold captain who I thought was Richard Dreyfus for a second, but isn't, but looks a lot like yeah. him. Yeah. It's mm. hang on, I got this. It's Scott Glenn. Yeah, very, very good in this role. I've seen him in other really bit good. parts before, or or mm. kind of character actor roles, but I think he really sells this character as this sort of you know reasonable but incredibly flinty guy. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. he's wearing the sort of the like Richard Dreyfuss like your dad glasses too. But he he looks mm-hmm. like yeah. like Stanley McChrystal level of like I eat one meal a day and run fifteen miles every morning. <laughs> like yeah, which is a type. Let's be honest. And he's just it's got tough that. to do that on yeah. a submarine. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Treadmill man, just just fucking treadmill man. <laughs> Yeah, and they <laughs> and they also have this incredibly gifted uh, savant sonar operator named uh, Seaman Jones, I believe, played yeah, by yeah. Courtney Vance, Courtney Vance. Mm-hmm. Do, doing doing mm-hmm. a great job. Uh, who mm-hmm. Cynthia let me know is married to Angela Bassett, ah. so a little bit of crossover oh, from uh, up for nice. Trash Future where we watched Strange Days. Uh, Angela Bassett chokes you and let, helps you get over your problems, and her husband is the fucking master of all things sound related. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the the chief of the boat the tells the, the new guy a story about how uh, Jones inadvertently deafened the entire Pacific submarine fleet with uh, Paganini by playing it through the fucking sonar. Mm-hmm. Which it was it was fun, it was charming. King. Yeah, it's yeah. a fun little little chat. They are, they are interrupted because they detect a new submarine out there in the water, uh, which is the Red October. Mm. Um, but not yet. Meanwhile, not yet because we have to have the scene yeah. where uh, so Sean Connery, Captain Captain Marco Ramius of the Red October, uh, has to meet in his cabin with the ship's political officer, uh, who is actually surnamed Putin, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. That's very funny. Yeah, yeah that was I, I, very funny. It was like Putin's waiting for you in your lock, and I was like, "Freaking Putin!" <laughs> yeah, played by what's he gonna do? Play, played by Peter Firth, who will be relevant if we ever do yeah. the UK uh, espionage TV show Spooks. Huh. But yeah, so he's possible. He kind of like obliquely threatens Ramius a lot. He's been like going through the things in his cabin. Yeah. It's implied that the KGB might have people on the boat, like, spying on Ramius. Yeah. He says this line where he says, privacy is not a major concern in the Soviet Union. <laughs> and my notes say, damn, imagine that. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I just wrote ideology and mass I was going to say, yeah, there, there are definitely some, some scenes, not, not massively through this film, but they are there periodically, where you were reminded that this film was made in 1990. It's like, we regret like mm-hmm. to inform you, communism is extremely bad. Yes. You're not allowed to go <laughs> between state to state or go fishing in communism. Well, well the, be- mm-hmm. the, best, the best line with that is uh, one that Putin sort of lands on, on Ramius, because uh, Ramius asks him, how many agents does the KGB have on my boat? And he says, your boat, Captain. Yes. This vessel belongs to the people of the Soviet Union. Also, give me your toothbrush. <laughs> I was, I was, I like, I was lying also. when I said personal property is different from public property. <laughs> Hand it over, bitch. <laughs> also, so, take this estrogen. Now you are transgender. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's something to discuss here, because spoilers for those of you who haven't watched The Red October, um, Ramius is not the antagonist of this movie. No. He's very much the deuteragonist. Mm-hmm. But at this point in the movie, they're still trying to get you to think he's the evil guy. 
So mm-hmm. there is so much going on that's just like, this guy's going to fucking nuke us. Like, mm-hmm. Putin's been going through his belongings and he's got a book where he's written the fucking... Um, Bit of a uh, book of revelation dist- about Armageddon. Yeah, yeah. Now I am like become that. whatever yeah. uh, Death destroyer destroyer of the world. Shit. The, 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 way they, the way they yeah, dig yeah, themselves yeah. back out of the hole of making them speak Russian in the opening is to, is to zoom in really close on uh, on Peter Firth's mouth mid-sentence while he's speaking Russian and then zoom mm. back out and he switches to English and everybody else is speaking English. It's, it's actually, really, really good. good. Yeah. It's, it's one of my favorite. I love little shots like this because there's a... Um, uh, listeners, if you've ever seen the film Judgment at Nuremberg, um, there's a really fantastic shot that's quite similar to this, where the action takes place in a courtroom and the, the characters are speaking German. We are behind the glass where the translators are sitting and they're like giving the English translation mm. and the camera pans up. And then as we come over the top of the glass, the actor switches mid-sentence into English. Wow, so really I, I, It's so good. I love little shots like this, but it, yeah, it's, it's a lovely, lovely little bit of cinema. I have seen this movie many times, and that's one of the few details that I remember from my first viewing. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it, it really is memorable. Like it's just it's mm-hmm. it's well done because obviously you realize that it would be a bit of a burden to have the entire film in Russian mm-hmm. when it's all you know English, Scottish, American actors. Yeah, yeah, and and bear in mind stuff that's like meant to be in spoken Russian, but is you know done these days doesn't bother doing that. Like Chernobyl didn't have a bit where like they you know stu- they switch yeah. from one to the other. It was all English doing. Uh, like mm. th- their own accents, all English actors. Yeah, there is a reference I'm trying to land here, and I don't actually know what I'm referencing here. But I offhandedly remember at one point some media I read as a child. It might have even been a web comic where one character says to the other something along the lines of "I'm speaking Russian," and the other says, "Yes, I am also speaking Russian." But since we both speak Russian, it sounds how English would to an English person, and then they just carry on. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That's, right. That's the best way to do it. So, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so Ramius and the Felicity yeah, we officer, understand each other. Uh, uh, they, they each have a key, and they use both keys to, to open the safe in Ramius's cabin uh, and open his orders, which are to go and uh, patrol such and such a grid square and do exercises with uh, mm. another, with a, like, a, like a hunter-killer submarine, like an alpha yeah. class. Yeah. And on reading this, Ramius is like, yep, okay, it's go time. Immediately murders Putin. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh yeah, straight up. Like, snaps. Breaks his neck. Yeah, like, he, he fucks uh, his fucking, he like breaks his trachea or something. So he's Basically like, does heavy attack on him, breaks yeah. his neck. <laughs> and, yeah. and you get this really creepy but well done scene where Putin is choking to death or in his death throes but with this horrible expression on his face but making eye contact with Ramius. Mm. And yeah, it's it, so I was telling this before we recorded that my dad took me and my brother to see this movie in theaters. And I was five and I understood nothing of what was happening mm. in the film at all. Mm. But I do remember this scene very clearly because it did make such an impression of like, mm. you know, a, it's like not bloody death scene, but like quite gruesome That's in a way. Horrifying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so, so, so and Ramius, Connery burns the orders. Yeah, he burns and, uh, the orders, takes uh, the political officer's key, and then stages the scene. He throws some some tea on the floor to make it look like he's slipped, and then calls for mm. the doctor. Yeah. He doesn't take the key just yet, but you are you are correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then, so, then we we cut to <laughs> doors guy. We got to talk to doors guy. Yeah. We got to go to doors guy. Doors it's guy a, goes. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you ever heard of a door? <laughs> There's probably there's probably some space behind both of these in mm-hmm. which you could you could use something. No, what 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 Doors guy actually tells Jack Ryan is that he thinks it's a caterpillar drive, um, mm-hmm. which he he describes by analogy as being like a jet engine but underwater. But because it doesn't have any moving parts, it's very quiet. Uh, mm. So quiet that this submarine could be undetectable to American sonar. Or almost. yeah, it's like. The water goes in the front and goes out the back. It is it is a real thing. Mm. Um, mm. It's just, it turns out it's actually really difficult to use because you need a lot of a lot of coolant and you need a lot of expertise. And if one thing goes wrong, then you've got a very hot engine. So it's easier to just have mm. the fucking... Yeah. I, I, it's I, easy to have a propeller. I know, I, I know it's just out. like, uh, you know, a plug can see, but there is something to... There's a little, little hauntological bit to it just being sort of accepted fact that like, Oh, the Soviet Union had like technologically outpaced us on this one thing. Like, Jack, I think mm-hmm. the Soviets have built yeah. a big sea do. I don't know what the fuck <laughs> we're going to do about it. But the doors guy actually says, like, Jack. yeah, yeah, we 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 tried to do this and we couldn't get it to work, and they have, mm. uh, which is interesting. Anyway, 
Yeah. Back, back aboard the Red October. Uh, and we see Dr. Petrov. Tim Curry is in this <laughs> movie. Tim fucking the Curry. The one place like, free of capitalism. The sea. Underwater. That's right. <gasps> Tim Curry, a, a, young a as shockingly Tim young Curry. Tim Curry. Yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, a baby. Yeah, Aye. who is playing Doctor Petrov, the ship's medical officer. Uh, mm -hmm. He he is zipping up Putin into a, into a body bag, uh, and Ramius stops him, takes Putin's launch key for the missiles. And he for the he calls over some guy who was nearby. It's like a yeah, cook's assistant cook. or some shit. A cook's assistant goes, logging off. Come That's witness this. His name. I am taking Cook's assistant logging off. <laughs> Should be logging off. <laughs> nice. Fucking the Soviet Union is all about logging off. That's the... right. <laughs> Not these Jesus. days. Cook's assistant touch grass enough. <laughs> <laughs> See, if Putin was still alive, he'd never be logging off. You'd nah. be fucking posting those disinformatskaya. His father was actually Central Asian. His name was Jackanin. <laughs> 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 Change it at fucking Soviet Union, Alice Island. What about this? <laughs> Marco so, yeah, he, posting. <laughs> he, uh, he, yeah, he calls this guy over and he's like, witness this, I'm taking the political officer's launch key. And and Tim Curry goes, well, you know, two people aren't, one person is supposed to have both launch keys. That means that you you could potentially, and then it just sort of leaves it at that and it comes yeah. to a next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ramia sort of like bullies him into submission and we establish that yeah, Petrov's yeah. character is sort of like, you know, he is, he is a good communist, but also a bit dim uh, and sort of mm -hmm. easily browbeaten. Because yeah. he's like, mm -hmm. we got to go back. Like, you can't sail without a political officer. And Connery is like, I don't give a shit. Like, mm -hmm. this, is, this is a combat vessel. Uh, yeah. We're far enough out at sea that we've swapped to English. We can't go back now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll have to zoom in on this guy's mouth again. <laughs> yeah, and he's fucking dead. He's the only guy who spoke Russian on the whole boat. <laughs> we're going to come back and we're not, they're not going to understand us. You hit international waters, you can just swap back to English. Yeah. <laughs> so Romeo switches his orders with a new set, mm -hmm. which he has uh, concocted himself. And then we get this scene where he addresses the crew over the tannoy. Uh, mm. And he, he he tells them that their orders are to escape detection from, we're led to believe, like, on an exercise, the whole Soviet Navy, uh, mm -hmm. lie in wait off of the eastern seaboard of the US. Um, and he, he says that it's like a new era in a game of chess. It reminds me of the heady days of Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin. This speech rouses his men to such heights that they begin to sing the Soviet mm. national anthem. Yeah, he says they're going to engage the Caterpillar Drive, park off New York City, listen to American rock and roll music, troll the Americans, yeah. uh, and then Cuba, go to Havana and the, have sex. The best possible mm. leave for any Soviet military conscript. Mm -hmm. Which oh, is demonstrated yeah. in the scene when he says the weather and comradeship are warm, and a guy stands up and does like, "Hey, she's got a great ass!" Fucking <laughs> hand gesture. Yeah, that's really yeah. incredible. Uber. Um, yeah, the guy's eye is like bulge Uber. out of his head. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, so they start singing the Soviet national anthem, uh, and on the USS Dallas, Jones, the sonar operator, half picks something up through the Caterpillar drive, and he's like. I think I can maybe hear singing. But then they lose the Red October, because when they turn on yeah. the Caterpillar drive, it goes totally dead. They can't hear them anymore. Totally mm -hmm. silent. Yeah, that's all right. So, Joan starts developing this theory that will, that will come into play later about exactly where he's going. But we then have to go to Moscow, which, mercifully, we don't get a big shot of St. Basil's Cathedral and a big title that yeah. says Moscow. Um, yeah, we just see the chair of the Red Fleet coming into work, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, whatever." Like, yeah, yeah. And he gets a little letter keep, like, from Ramis. greasing him. It's it's quite Death of Stalin. This I quite like it. Like mm. every everybody like stands to attention as he goes past, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." Just old, it's an old dude. Um, and he gets, he a, gets letter a letter from Ramius, and we don't mm -hmm. see what it says, but like we see him like, and he like knocks over his cup of tea and doesn't pay attention. So we surmise that this letter is very, very uh, important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And at this point in the story, we're still being led to believe it means like he's going to go rogue and nuke America. Yes. Yeah, yes. and James L. Jones says as much to yeah. um, to uh, Jack Ryan back in yeah, back exactly. in America. 
Uh, they're like, look, we there's yeah. He drags him to the White House Situation Room uh, in order to brief um, Foghorn Leghorn National Security Advisor <laughs> <laughs> about yeah, the, right? about the existence of doors. Right. So yeah. J- Jack Ryan the gets Russians up have there. developed doors. He's like, yo, they got these doors, and this Listen. this sends sort of the Joint Chiefs and everyone into into a frenzy because. Uh, <laughs> like by God, <laughs> door yeah. technology. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we hadn't figured out how to. They've put hinges on a wall, sir. What? <laughs> we messed with this a few years ago, but we couldn't make it work. This is such a bad bit. <laughs> how does I he get in the to room? Doing this bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what's what's it's happened? Just, it, they know that yeah. the entire Soviet Navy has been scrambled after the Red October, and yeah, they're like, they're Shit. rapidly given Ramius. Ramius has gone rogue. He's going to come and he's going to fucking obliterate the entire United States. Um, and Alec Baldwin is like, no, there's another possibility. Yeah, he has a moment of sort of like analytic genius. Yeah, he's like, he's trying yeah. to defect. He's trying to flee the Soviet Union. And they're like, why? What's your evidence? And he says, because today is the one year anniversary of his wife's death. And that's kind of the extent of his evidence, really. <laughs> his, his other evidence is, I met him one time. Of, yeah, uh, do he seemed very, very funny and down cool. to earth. <laughs> yeah, I told him how many Twitter followers I had, and he was like, "That sounds really cool." Oh my! And God. then it was kind of embarrassing. You know, he he's got <laughs> genuinely Jack Ryan throughout this if I film that. <laughs> is able to predict things correct correctly, and the plot hinges quite often on him bluffing. And his sole mm. justification for this is vibes. Yes, like just yeah. Yeah. vibes. I think it's like. I, I don't know. I, I kind of see why it appealed to you know Reagan and the sort of like Bush era CIA and shit to have a hero who was an analyst rather than uh, like a sort of like mm. operator guy, yeah. I guess. But the way in which he does that for this plot is essentially like vibes, as hunches. Um, also, yeah. I cannot stress enough: the National Security Advisor does sound like Falcon Leghorn. He sounds like yeah. fucking Jim Garrison and JFK. Mm. Yeah, he's like, I'm a politician, which means I'm a cheating yeah. liar. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their lollipops. And it's just like, it's, <laughs> it's a perfect. Okay, a perfect we get plan. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he says to Alec Baldwin, you've got three days to prove your theory, after which point, like, we're going to have to find this guy and, and sink, sink it. And Alec Baldwin's like, whatever else, we need to steal the submarine. Like, we need to actually get the submarine because if they've built this thing, we need it. Um, yeah. Um, meanwhile, Stellan Skarsgård is in the film. <laughs> Well, no, uh, because the Falkhorn Leghorn is like, well, we got to send someone down there. Uh, and Jack Ryan is like, oh, yeah, yeah, you do. And he he slowly realizes to his horror that he is being volunteered for this. Uh, it's really good. Because he is like expendable. Uh, and so they're just going to yeah. send him out on his own to figure it out. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, across town, across the North Also in, in that scene is, is the second time that someone says to Jack Ryan, how long has it been since you got some sleep? And he goes, "Oh, it's been it's been a hot second, pal. I'll be <laughs> honest." And I wanted that to keep going. Yeah, this is kind I really of a problem. To... He doesn't look that tired, really. I wanted mm. him to get so much more tired throughout the course of this fucking movie. Yeah, just like he's too every young scene being like, "Dude, tired. Are you, mm. have you had a nap yet, man?" And he's just felt like, "No, no, I've mm. been going for the entire course he's of this just, movie." He's like slamming Don't monster worry. the whole time. So, so, so we see mm. we see the the Konovalov. Uh, that's how they pronounce it. I don't know if it's Konovalov or whatever, but uh, we see the Konovalov, uh, this attack submarine that was supposed to rendezvous with the Red October, and uh, it's it's filmed the way that Star Trek films like war aliens, like fucking Kardashians yeah. and shit. It's all yeah, dark baby. angles. Everybody has a light like shining across their face in a really weird mm. pale blue, green and red, and, red and like yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Stellan Skarsgård is the captain of this film, and uh, he, he gets his he gets his orders. He's he's kind of like um intemperate is the vibe. Uh, we know mm-hmm. he's been trained by Ramius, but he's kind of like more abrasive and like more impatient with his crew. Um, I'll I'll say this about the Skarsgårds: they're the one acting dynasty that I fully believe have earned it. Oh yeah, like Stellan is a fucking legend, and all of the Skarsgård mm-hmm. children fucking nail it. Mm-hmm. So he 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 sets off after them in like hot pursuit. Mm-hmm. That's right. 
Uh, we also discovered He's that like, Connery's uh, officers are really pissed off with him because he announced their intention to defect in his letter. He's like, fuck you, I'm out. And they were like, yes. why did you tell them we were doing? De- like, the whole Navy's coming after us, you dick. Like, the dumbest and he's thing like, you could I don't give a done. shit. Yes. No, his justification was, he says, when Cortez reached the New World, he burned his ships and it gave his men motivation. So you're mm-hmm. led to believe that he just told the fucking Russians that they were defecting so that... <laughs> They got no fucking choice now, baby. You're yeah. defecting. <laughs> yeah. It's really good. He's like, you know, fuck all of you. Yeah. And he's and he's like, yeah, I give us like one chance in three. They're probably gonna kill all mm-hmm. of us. Uh yeah. a, a nice touch that I do like is uh Sam Neil Borodin, his his two IC, his XO. Yeah, Boromir. Uh Boromir. Uh he he like backs him up in public in the officer's mess, but as soon as mm-hmm. the other officers leave. He, he is like, uh, he confronts him in private, and he's like, you know I would never criticize you in front of, like, junior officers, but... But you're a however, dick. Yes. What the fuck, dude? <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite good, it establishes, like, this sort it's of, really like, good. relationship of trust. We, we've yeah. been told uh, by Ryan when he's, like, briefing uh, Falcon Lycorn that Ramius has probably trained all of these officers himself, and he's hand-picked them mm-hmm. for this. Um... But the thing that they're worried about is that this is strictly an like an officer's defection. Uh, the crew mm-hmm. not involved cannot know because if the crew know, then they might uh, you know revolt and turn the the ship back to its rightful owners. But, the people mm-hmm. of the Soviet Union, along with Marco Ramius's toothbrush. That's but, right. Uh, he uh, he is shown to genuinely care about his men. Yes, like he is mm-hmm. insistent that they get rescued from the boat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe you can say that that's part of his plan is so that they think that the boat's been scuttled. No, you wouldn't but... need all of them. It it, it really is f- uh, like filmed and written as a like father to his men thing. Yeah, um, it was genuinely very yeah. nice. Mm. Yeah, I, I do feel as though that's sort of the um, like there's meant to be this idea of fraternity between Ramius and people like Jack Ryan or Captain Mancuso, and it's just sort of like good guy in a bad system versus these guys who are good guys in a good system and i recognize that's the sort of cold war hollywood logic Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. you do get that point that like there's this idea that that being get getting to the position that he's in you know requires him to have the same kind of values that people like to exalt themselves in the west for having i'm not trying to be Mm -hmm. a campus here about this but there is this Mm -hmm. extent to which he's portrayed as being singular and i do find it very funny that one of the reasons why he's portrayed as being singular is that because he's lithuanian yes like as we know there are no such thing as bad lithuanians (laughs) yeah that's that that is one of ryan's vibes is that he's he's not russian he's lithuanian uh okay (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he's just one of the fucking Soviet Union's single most decorated submarine captains. <laughs> yeah. But he is Lithuanian, so I think we can yeah. get him. Yeah, we get hints of this throughout, but like the reason why he's defecting is, uh, as, as Homer Simpson once scrawled on a legal pad, dead wife. Uh, <laughs> First of all, no fucking way is a guy called Marco Ramius Lithuanian. Put some fucking Zs in there and I'll believe you. <laughs> mm-hmm. His his in the book this is explained a bit more, and his dead wife dies during surgery because the uh, the surgeon who botches it is uh, like uh, uh, th- like the son of a central committee member and cannot face uh. any consequences, and so that disillusions uh. him with the system. Yeah, that oh, sucks. I'm sure There's that definitely... sort of thing would never happen in the United States or indeed in Britain, where our medical system is famously really good and not mm. run by people who should have retired a long fucking time ago. Definitely no nepotism. I'd like to defect to the United Kingdom where there's a doctor named Shipman. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to defect to the United Kingdom so that I can finally get my pushy surgery. <laughs> 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 I've been on a waiting list in Lithuania for 17 years now. My well, wife, she, she died because she, she got the pushy surgery badly. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Sean Connery wakes up Sean Connery wakes up on a bed and he's like, where's my wife? And they're like, who do you think gave you the pussy? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so Ryan, Ryan, Ryan has to go to the scene, but unfortunately, the scene is just like the sea, the Atlantic. So they yeah. they yeah. dump him on an aircraft carrier uh, in the middle of a carrier strike group, and he now has my favorite job and the job I wish I had: being paid to steal valor uh, because right. they put him in a U.S. Navy commander's uniform, um, and he like 
introduces himself to the the admiral commanding this this carrier strike group, who is also Falcon Lycorn. There's two Falcon Lycorns in this movie. Every American has Falcon Lycorn in this movie. That's right. This uh, is Jack. This is what happens in the Jack Ryan books: is that every American is Falcon Lycorn. Yeah, and the captain of the aircraft carrier itself. He the first thing he does is apologize for stealing valor. Uh, yeah, never apologize. Mm-hmm. He, he's just like, yeah, uh, James L. Jones made me wear this uniform as a joke <laughs> to insult you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think his idea is that it's like it's a low profile thing to make him go undercover as a naval officer. Yeah, so he's not just wandering around in a suit and tie, like, like obviously being from the CIA. It immediately backfires because as soon as he leaves, the captain of the aircraft carrier is like, I don't like him. <laughs> he's you, st- and you he's get stealing a valor. Wonderful. Yeah. You get a wonderful scene where where the mm. the guy who brings him in af- after he leaves and the captain of the naval vessel is like, I don't like he's wearing a uniform, I reckon he should not be doing that. The guy's like, listen, man, he wasn't allowed to join the army because he's got bad eyes. You should cut him some <laughs> <sleep>. <laughs> Yeah, this is the scene that I would write, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, oh yeah, he's, he's he, like, listen, he's, he's, he's read a lot of books and he's trying real hard, <laughs> all right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. To- he's a troop in spirit. <laughs> Leave him alone. <laughs> Making yeah, he's uh he's culturally military but non-practicing. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he's colorblind. I'm so- we hear that he uh, he became a CIA analyst because he he was going to be in the military uh, more. Yeah, he was in the naval academy, at, at, but he was injured during training so severely that mm-hmm. he had to basically learn how to walk again, and so he was not in the navy. But he would have been a naval officer yeah. otherwise. So, so you're not allowed to call him a pussy. Uh, mm-hmm. Which is yeah, fine. I, I wanted to throw something in there, oh. really, just really quickly. That y- I, I take your point about it's less conspicuous for him to be in a, a commander's uniform than it would be for him to be in a suit and tie. Because the first thing that came to mind was I don't know if you remember the character Tommy, who has one little bit scene in Apocalypse Now, who's just the CIA guy with the bowl cut, who says terminate him with extreme prejudice. Oh, but yeah. basically, like <laughs> <laughs> that's who he would be on this aircraft carrier <laughs> if he wasn't in a uniform. <laughs> Also, another funny little coincidence, the aircraft carrier is called the USS Enterprise. Huh. Mm. It is, which I believe is real. It is. Big E. I think there, yeah. is, there is a USS Enterprise, I think. Yeah, there is. Um, so, we have a scene of the Red October navigating through a sort of underwater canyon. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and Jones on the Dallas has a theory that that's what they're doing. And he tries to, like, convince his captain. Uh, yeah, who is he's picked them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the captain, Captain Mancuso, the least emotionally demonstrative man in history, uh, Mm. is just sort of like, you know, like staring totally pinched faced at the charts. And Jones is getting like more and more uh, like uh, sort of insistent because he thinks he's not buying it. And Mancuso just goes, yeah, you already sold me on this. So just do Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Soviets are. Go ahead. Sorry. No, okay. You, you get you get a callback to a line that uh, that Doorman said earlier, which is that they you wouldn't pick up this uh, this fucking engine on the sonar or the radar. It mm-hmm. would assume that it's like volcanic activity or seismic mm-hmm. or something. And this guy this guy's like, yeah, we picked this shit up, and the fucking computer says that it might be a seismic activity. But here's my theory: we developed mm-hmm. this for. Uh, to detect seismic activity. So I think what happens is when it has something it doesn't understand, it just sort of defaults back to that. Mm. Yeah. And then he plays it at 10 times speed and it does sound like a rhythmic engine. Yeah. It's, and it's, this is, it's this is nice. great. It's yeah. good. It's, <laughs> it's, well done. it's, it's, it's good. a taut, well-paced, well-acted yeah. thriller. I don't know why I suggested that we do this. And um, meanwhile, yeah. the Soviets are, are navigating. So, so the Red October is navigating through this channel uh, off mm. their, you know... Um, their oceanographic charts because mm. they can't yeah, really see Iceland. anything. My, my mm-hmm. notes basically say, now this is pod racing because <laughs> mm-hmm. 100% that's what the scene reminded me because it's basically them yeah. sort of blindly following the maps, doing like water orienteering, avoiding mountains. Uh, mm. And yeah, I mean, it's 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 tense. It's very well done. Like it's the, very the, cool. And yeah. you kind of get into the whole way, like the precision involved and like you said, the clock and the charts and the calculations and like on my signal, five, four, three, two, one, mark, that kind of stuff. Like it's cool. It's just like yeah, podcasting. It's, it's, yeah, it's and, and, legitimately and really every sick turn, because Ramius makes are... them go faster, and they have to readjust. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it, really cool. You can kind of hear the bridge crew getting uh, more and more nervous, and Ramius, of course, does not look phased at all. You are only allowed to defect because if you're the thing good at about math. it, and like 
if you're just hearing us describe this, you're not really getting the full thing of it. Genuinely watch this movie. It's really good. Yeah, it's but the good. thing is, they are navigating through a really tight passageway and they don't have a, like a fucking windscreen, right? Mm-hmm. This is like inside of a building and they are just doing the maths from a chart to figure out mm-hmm. exactly where they are and what they have to do. Yeah, so and you know you fucked up when everyone dies. That's the only time yeah, yeah, you know exactly. that you fucked it, up. It, it, it's like, it's like around. Doing... One of them's got a stopwatch. One of them has like a fucking little conversion a wheel where roll. he's like doing yeah. the maths. And like it, it's fucking sick. It's so fucking it, sick. It's basically like doing <laughs> a Boy Scout orienteering course, except if you make a mistake, right. that you get crushed in a Coke can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, in fact, the, the navigator says, uh, you know, like, give me a map and a stopwatch and I'll fly the Alps in a plane with no windows. Uh, mm. So that that's your analogy. For that. <sighs> Which I can only say is yeah. rock. King. Incredib- yeah. Incredible work. Insanely yeah. good. And like the, di- and... the dynamic between the different officers, like uh, S- Sam Neill being the sort of like the stalwart, but you can see him getting more unnerved, but still trying to like reassure mm. the others. Uh, he- he's so good. He's such a good actor. <sighs> yes. And we Sam also Neill. see that Sorry, the first... Caterpillar drive has been sabotaged. Yeah. It, it, yes. We get a sort of jump scare fake out where we're, we're meant to think that it's like hit the walls of this underwater canyon that they're racing through. Uh, and instead, there's been an explosion that has taken the the Caterpillar drive offline. Um, and the engineer believes it is targeted sabotage. Someone has just ripped mm-hmm. a circuit board out of it. Um, Comrade Loganoff, you are the saboteur. <laughs> uh, I am nobody, talking to you through your Someone whisper, sus yeah. on board, Captain. Nobody actually there says is an the words among us in this movie, <laughs> or I would have recorded that drop and be playing it at 500 mm. decibels right now. I mean, I was making reference to the BBC of a CBBC series Saboteur, <laughs> which is really quite good, actually. A classic. <laughs> yeah, the TV um, adaptation of Among Us. Um, yeah. So, Among Us. So, you, you, the thing about Sam Neill, I just want to really quickly, yeah. is that he was in the runnings to be a Bond. Yeah. We, we even saw the mm-hmm. screen test on the YouTube zone quite recently. He couldn't sell where, like, the he voice. He looks great. Yeah, that's the one problem, is that he looks yeah. great. He's then got again, a great we have presence, Welsh-ass but, Dalton. Is the thing? Yeah, we do. Dalton has a phenomenal fucking screen presence. You leave my boy alone. Selling dope. Uh, Selling dope. (laughs) So the Soviet (laughs) ambassador comes to the U.S. national security advisor um, to try and bullshit him, essentially, Mm -hmm. Uh, in a sort of like uh, this guy. We've we've lost a submarine, Um, Mm -hmm. and so that's why our entire surface fleet is just out. We're doing a big yeah, rescue. It's a, it's a rescue operation. Don't ask we any promise. questions. Do not offer to help us. Uh, it's a funny I, moment where, they, where he does offer to help them, and he's like, uh, "I'll pass that along." Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check in the back. Um, the Soviet yeah. ambassador, and this was the reference I was desperately yeah. trying to learn. The Soviet ambassador has such a heavy vibe of fucking Peter Bull in Doctor Strangelove as the Ooh, Russian ambassador. Yeah. He's just like the sweatiest cunt alive and he's like, uh, uh, um, yeah, his, no, no, we don't need your help right his, now, his man. His direction fine, fine, here is like Phoenix Wright witness who has been caught in two or more lights. Um, it's, yeah, he's just like constantly wiping his brow being like, uh, com- comrade, uh, sorry, Mr. President, we're fine, don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's played by Joss Ackland who's done loads of, uh, he's done loads of, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like villain shit, but uh, because awesome because the caterpillar drive is disabled, the Red October is detected by a Soviet uh, anti-submarine warfare uh, plane, mm-hmm. which drops a torpedo into the water, and so yes. in an incredibly tense scene, they have to sort of race through this closely plotted track through an underwater canyon, and Ramius takes them out of it. He delays them making a turn. Um, we think leading them directly into, into a rock wall um, in order to fake out this torpedo by turning at the last mm-hmm. minute. Uh, mm-hmm. And you can see, it's beautifully done. You can see everyone get more and more tense. And when they finally turn, Sam Neill gives, uh, gives Sean Connery a little look of recognition uh, as the boat, mm-hmm. like, pitches over to one side and Sean Connery just reaches out his hand and stops his glass of coffee that is sliding oh, so down cool. the table. It's, it's so ice fucking... cold. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not a fucking hint of emotion on his face, just... Because this is like, Ramius isn't a particularly good commander because although he is very gifted, he never explains anything he does, which is like... Yeah. Not the best way to uh, to lead, perhaps. I, I, I was thinking about this. Um, wasn't it Harrison Ford in was it uh, was it K nineteen? What's the film called? Uh, the Ooh, submarine movie with oh Harrison shit. Ford in it. Yeah, We're like K nineteen, the, the Widowmaker. The Widowmaker. It's the same mm-hmm. kind of approach, but he's so much more aloof and uncompromising. And mm-hmm. in a way, it's like you see that comparison. That for some reason, maybe it's just like the the camaraderie between these guys that are in on the plot. Maybe it's just. Uh, Sean Connery selling the role in a in a different way, but like he doesn't have that sort of like my decision is final, fuck you if you die kind of way about him that Harrison mm-hmm. Ford's character does. He manages. There's like there's like this. I, I don't I want to call it Bond or some shit. You know that would be really really funny and stupid, <laughs> but more just like there's this sort of precision. Like he knows better, and that like you just you, like he's unflappable, and I, I really expertise. do appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, and, and Sam Neill like, wants to live in Montana yeah. and uh, have, an, have an RV. <laughs> have a and random also, like, wife. I mean, yeah, it's ma- good. He, he said around American wife. My man likes Americans. He's a man after my own heart. Mm-hmm. He, wa- he yeah, wants this- to like drive from state to state without a propiska. Uh, and is, this, is, this idea is like a novelty to him that you can just drive whenever. Um, this is this is the moment I started getting legitimately upset because Sam Neill in this scene is doing the absolute... Hey, I keep in my helmet a picture of my girl back home. Yeah, <laughs> can I see her any minute now, buddy? S- speech number, like Sam. No, Sam. No, Sam, shut don't the fuck do up. it. Don't do it. Sam, you're making it to Montana. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> so um, you'll have two wives. It's fine. So aboard <laughs> aboard the Enterprise, the aircraft carrier, Ryan has this sort of moment of realization because he's trying to reason through this, and he's like, "Okay, Ramius wants to defect. How are we going to get?" the crew off of the submarine. And then his his moment of realization is, we don't have to think that up. He must have already thought of a way to do this. All we mm-hmm. have to do is predict it enough to be able to facilitate it. Uh, and he's like, how do you get, how do you make the crew want to leave a nuclear submarine? And a big sort of comical light bulb goes off over his head. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. It's mm-hmm. just spooky atoms. Spooky assets. Yeah. Oh, they also figure out that um that the Dallas has the so oh, the Dallas has been chasing a seismic anomaly and Ryan's like, that's it, they found the Red October, yeah. you've got to get me on board the Dallas. Yes. Get me on the Dallas, which requires a helicopter flight. Uh which uh, again, every time he's again, in a plane yeah. in this movie, he's just or uh any kind of aircraft in this movie, he's visibly hating it, which is a nice touch. Mm. Yeah, um, the line he says both times is just next time you have a bright idea, Jack, write a memo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they take him in all this cold weather gear uh, to to rendezvous with the submarine, which is far enough out that they have essentially zero uh, like waiting time once they're there. They have mm-hmm. to they have to be there, and the Dallas has to already be there. Otherwise, it's off, and they just they're just gonna have to fly back. Um, and so when they get there, and the Dallas isn't there. Uh, Ryan sort of like bullies them into using an extra ten minutes of fuel that he has invented from yeah. nowhere. Yeah, he he kind of finds his assertiveness, which is what his character needed to find. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, but then and he gets some for the Dallas. W- uh, well, not so easily is the thing. They've got to lower him down in like a, a horse collar, right? Um, and it's it's a, it's a safety harness. Yeah, and it's, this is a real thing. Mm. Mm. Uh, literally, it's like a guy on the Dallas with a big hook. And they warn that guy, you know, stay grounded, otherwise you will just get electrocuted by the static electricity off of the helicopter rotor blades. Mm. Um, but it's in like uh, a sort of a reasonably bad sea state, and it's raining, uh, and they have to try and lower Ryan down with like less and less fuel while this guy tries to grab onto him. And when they can't make it, uh, Ryan just ditches the harness and just like jumps into the water. Mm-hmm. It's very. Uh, so I, I, I want to talk about something really quickly about this. So that's mm. the, what this is called. Is this, this is a spies insertion, and I've forgotten what the acronym is. But spies and fries, literally, they're acronyms for Hilo Ops. And fries would be hanging to a rope, like clipped into a rope. And in this case, like it's uh, he's, he's literally like a seat, like a safety harness. This is done for. Uh, it can be done for medical evacuation or in this kind of thing, an insertion. And there's there are two details about this that I really I was fucking hooting and hollering out of just joy that they paid attention to detail. 
is number one, the guy saying, have you ever done this before? And he was like, yeah, once off Hawaii in perfect conditions. <laughs> uh, because this is the kind of thing you do in training, but it's, it's only typically done in emergencies. Mm -hmm. And so it's, this is the worst possible condition to be doing it in. Uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, you've got the guy trying to hook up the static discharge wand. And that's a thing that unless you fucking know stuff about helicopters, you just wouldn't think of. But helicopters mm -hmm. generate a ton of static electricity. They even say in this with this weather, it's going to be like it's going to be like a power station. And if if they were to touch Jack Ryan, touch his his, his rope or his rope, his cable, any metal part on it without that discharge one being hooked up to. And I'm not joking. They need to connect a hook to either his rope or to the discharge port on the helicopter. There's like a loop, like a ground loop on the bottom of the helicopter they would get electrocuted. And there's, there's a scene in which they accidentally connect for a second and there's like an arc. Um, that's just a thing that you'd learn about in helicopter safety stuff that okay. I, when you see like a typical Hollywood movie, how it approaches helicopters, they're just like magic whirly things that can do anything. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's just a detail. I was like, yeah, that's right. You would have to do that. That is a safety concern. Otherwise you would die in the process. And so like, I know it's dumb and I'm sure they had technical advisors, the Navy, all that stuff, you know, this is, this is probably the deep state. But I did appreciate that like the helicopter, it wasn't just helicopter magic. Like the there really were limitations. Mm -hmm. There were limitations on this that, you know, the storytelling didn't uh, allow the magic of the plot to resolve a technical limitation that does exist in real life. Yeah. And I thought that was like, this is really well done. I was like, like, yeah. It, yeah, right? yeah. it works like, sort of in confluence with the plot that like this mm. guy is uh, sort of out of his comfort zone being put through a bunch of uh, sort of like various trials in order to, uh, you know, make good on his hunch, which I like yeah, a lot. Yeah, it's fun mm -hmm. as well that the, the film poses this like, it's not really a moral challenge that Jack Ryan has to oh, overcome or a challenge of character. Well, yeah, it is. But also it's like a technical challenge, which is like, yeah. okay, there's a guy on a submarine somewhere in the Atlantic. We have to find him first and figure out what he wants and communicate with him. So it's like an interesting, like, how do you actually accomplish this task? Yeah. It's something and I wanted to throw out there too really quickly is also just the fact that, you know, you have the fuel limitations. You're literally about to go bingo on your 10 mm -hmm. minutes, your magic 10 minutes, like you said, that's only used in wartime. The boat can't communicate unless it's high up enough to communicate under its normal channels. They can't see it unless they happen to be in the right spot. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the thing that really got me about it too was watching this stuff take place is that there's a reason for the backstory for Jack Ryan. Like they've told you the thing. It's like, it's not just, hey, you know, this guy was going to be in the military, this thing happened to him, but he has to basically relive a trauma he experienced that mm. changed the course yeah, of his life yeah. in order to Mm -hmm. Like you said, follow up on his hunch. So it's like he's being put through like his own private mental hell that he has to get through. It's sort of like, uh, sir, we heard you were bitten by a brown recluse and have severe arachnophobia. Well, this Russian guy wants to ref wants to defect from a nest of spiders. And it's like, <laughs> it's basically what they've accomplished here. Yeah. It's yeah. cool. Really good. It's really fucking good. He, he, he does get a board. thing that I want been... to bring up, and mm. it's not... Not directly related to this, but the, in the previous scene of Sam Neill, we, we skipped over again. Connery's character is shown to genuinely care about his crew because Sam mm. puts forward the idea of dropping them off near the coast of Newfoundland, which they could get to in like 16 hours. And he goes, no, there's no way they would survive in the cold long enough to be rescued. We have to go mm. to Maine. Mm. And it's, it's just good. Like he's continually, he's risking himself. He's risking the success of this mission just to make sure that his crew are okay. Yeah. Yeah. We see that he's very tired of the conflict as well. He's like, I've been at sea my whole life and I've just missed yeah. my whole life and like hasn't accomplished anything. Like it's all kind of pointless. Yeah, he he, he calls it yeah, a war he, without He says battles. of his wife, I widowed her mm. the day we married. A couple of lines that go incredibly as soon, as hard as and I think a pure yeah. adaptation. I don't remember right? that from the book. Uh, he also says a war without no. battles, without monuments, only casualties. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I thought that was really, really oh, well that's done. Fucking sick. I, 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 do, I do suspect that that's all adaptation because in what will be the least surprising news to any of you, I read a lot of Tom Clancy books when I was a kid, <laughs> uh, and the actual, the actual now, book, I, The Hunt wow. for Red October. Huh. Yeah, I know. Weird, right? Uh, is it's a, it's a <laughs> lot more technically focused, but there's also a lot more on the sort of like operational level right there's uh a lot more about yeah. what other uh other submarines what other surface forces are doing uh there's like a whole subplot with the british that is involved uh whatever fine. i also somewhat don't suspect that for the first the first tom clancy book mm. uh well not i don't think it was the first one yeah it was it was, it was his first, first novel i don't think you would go the 
Yeah, I don't think you'd go the man war fucking sucks for everyone involved angle if you were going to write <laughs> eight hundred thousand more books yeah, about yeah, how yeah. war is good. Yeah, the 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 only really Tom yeah. Clancy sentiment in there is like a fascination with a secret war, and that's something that'll persist mm-hmm. later on uh, in a lot more sort of like oh, yeah. land based fashions, uh, and and it leads to his sort of fascination I'll wait until with, we do the. Uh, what you might call the Tom like Tom Clancy fucking Venezuela series. Yeah, on Amazon yeah, e- exactly. Oh. It's sort of fascination with direct action, uh, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, I mean, if you want to be part of a secret war that involves direct action and just like generally fucking shit up on a secret basis, just transition, Tom. <laughs> Tom, just, Tom Clancy. Just do it. Tom Clancy looked like the boomer Wojak, um, <laughs> and also thought that way. Any case, He's drug. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan jumps into the water where he is retrieved by uh, a diver from the Dallas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and like the second he disconnects himself from the fucking cable, the helicopter pilot's like, "Well, your problem now, Dallas," and just fuck <laughs> off instantly. Yeah. which I really See, enjoyed. Lads. Yeah, they're like, "All Beautiful. right, well, nothing we can do." Yeah, the, the, I mean, the fuel clock doesn't stop like ticking down, mm-hmm. right? Uh, oh yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And the Dallas have just received orders to find and sink yes, the Red October. Because, because yeah. the Soviets have now said, uh, actually, this guy's gone rogue and he's going to kill you all. Please help us destroy him immediately. Yes. Yeah, because yes. you get another shot of the fucking ambassador being like, uh, 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 Comrade President, we, uh, we actually do want your help now, please, my friend. Yeah, we need to destroy this guy yes. now. Because um, so, so, the Russians still uh, want the Americans to yeah. up. And, and so oh, yeah, Ma- Mancuso both does not like and trust Ryan. Uh, and also mm-hmm. d- uh, will not disobey his orders. Yeah. And so Ryan has to convince him uh, a- a- in an extremely hostile environment. And one thing I did like about this is that they captured the sort of like claustrophobia, right? Like Ryan can't yeah. move without being in someone's way. Uh, there's mm-hmm. too many people around him. Uh, and he's trying to trying to convince this captain who has been following Red October not to uh, not to launch on him. Uh, and the way he does this is by telling him, I know this guy, I know Ramius. Mm-hmm. Um, has he made any crazy Ivans yet? And a crazy Ivan is uh, something that we've seen briefly earlier in the movie. It's like a habitual practice for Russian submarine captains uh, to like abruptly turn to one side so that they can like throw off pursuers. Because mm-hmm. uh, uh, if you're following somebody in a submarine, they can't hear you following... Like, like, if you're like following someone, they won't be able to hear you. Uh, if if you like stay directly behind them, yeah, if you're in their so they battles, turn very suddenly. Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you turn very suddenly, you can see if there's anyone behind you. Mm-hmm. And so Ryan predicts that uh, his next, the next crazy item that he makes is going to be to starboard because he always turns to starboard in the bottom half of the hour. Uh, and so. As they are about to to fire on the Red October, that's exactly what happens. Um, mm-hmm. And he he convinces him that you know I know this guy. I'm inside this guy's head, and he wants mm-hmm. to defect. I've read his tweets, and this this part I quite like. We get a sort of like attempted uh, inter submarine <laughs> forming a parasocial relationship with a Russian submarine. <laughs> <laughs> But no, they, they, they try and like communicate it through two vessels that are I know not this at all. Guy. I, I'm a high subscriber on his Patreon. Well I know suited. exactly. What I'm, I'm his king simp. <laughs> <laughs> so the way they get his attention, the way they do the tier three sub, is to put the engines <laughs> full aft in the Thank ba- you for that. and like to to oh. like cavitate the propellers of the submarine so that they can hear them. It makes a very like obvious noise mm-hmm. to the Red October Old, old man Connery voice. Oh, uh, thank you, Jack Ryan, for the super chat. <laughs> <laughs> As he is in his tier three sub. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the tier three sub surface, uh, and the, the, the two captains exchange uh, Morse messages by signal light over Periscope. Like, you up? Yeah, y- yo, you up? Uh, and and Ryan is sort of like writing these for Mancuso, uh, and and tells him if you want to defect, go due south to this very deep water, the Laurentian mm-hmm. abyss. Um, yeah. And and at this point, Mancuso asks him, "How did you know he was going to turn starboard at the bottom half of the hour?" And uh, in one of the one of the better character moments, Ryan's just like, "I didn't. I had a fifty fifty chance." Uh, mm-hmm. And you weren't yeah. gonna you weren't Good. gonna listen to anything else. It's great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So vibes. It was vibes. Vibes. It was vibes. vibes, baby. Was vibes. Um, so the Red October proceeds to the Laurentian Abyssal, uh, and then the captain sets off. Well, rather, the chief engineer, who is like in on this because he's one of the senior officers, sets off mm. a false radiation alarm, uh, mm. which. In this sort of great show of reluctance, Ramius is like pers- allows himself to be persuaded by the doctor, by the medical officer, that they have to evacuate the crew uh, mm-hmm. because he, you know, he doesn't want to. Um, and so they they surface the submarine, and there's an American ship, an American warship, an American frigate closing in on them, and it tells them, you know, do not, uh, you know, do not submerge or you'll be fired upon. And it's at this point that. We get, you know, say the line, Doctor Petrov. Uh, mm-hmm. Sean, oh, yeah. Sean Connery goes right. You you take the crew off to be rescued. I and the senior officers will stay behind and scuttle the ship. And Doctor Petrov, yeah. with tears in his eyes, says, "You'll receive the order of Lenin for this, Captain." Yeah, it's very it's cool. really great. Good. It's so good. It's great. Uh, oh, you'll receive the order of Lenin for this, comrade. <laughs> <laughs> The I Rosette need someone to tell me Kronstein. that shit in my day to day life. Man. You will oh, yeah. receive the Rosette of Kronstein for this, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> you will receive the uh, Cross of the, Good Night. The Americans <laughs> make a. This, so the submarine goes below, and the Americans make a show of firing a torpedo at it. Um, but they deliberately, like, self destruct their torpedo at the last minute, or James Earl Jones, yes. like, leans into the frame and presses the button. Uh, and then he has this great bit where he says to the guy launching the missile, he was like, now, um, you have to understand, Commander. Uh, the submarine did not self-destruct. You heard it hit the hull, and then he like shows him his ID, and he goes, "And I was never here." <laughs> it's this very cool little moment. It's really good. Yes. It's, it's a cl- one mm. of the classic lines. Yeah. So, so now the, the sort of like the, the the technical aspects of this movie kind of go out of the window a little bit because mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So Ryan and Jones, for some reason, is along on this, and Mancuso. Take uh, a a submarine rescue vessel over to the Red October. We actually this... saw the doorman building it earlier on. It's yeah, nice this rescue callback. vessel was set up right at the very start. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, booted and hollered when I saw it. Yes, the, they meet with each other for the first time, uh, mm-hmm. and there's this sort of very tense series of moments. Most notably, Bankuso is armed. He has brought a sidearm mm-hmm. with him because he doesn't trust the, the Soviets not to change their minds about the defection. Mm-hmm. But... Connery, is a, he requests asylum. He's like, I'm, I, I give you my ship, I request asylum. Uh, you have this yeah. truly tense moment when they're both yeah. on board, like, and the two, the two crews are just stood on opposite sides of the fucking bridge looking at each other and no one's speaking. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. oh god, oh no. And, and, and the way they break Attention that is, so uh, uh, both Ramius and Ryan realize that the other one speaks Russian or English, respectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, which, which I quite like. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, I forget in which order these two things happen. They get the bridge gets shot at by fucking Skarsgård. He's back. Skarsgård. Yes. Yeah, this is the one that happens first. Skarsgård fucking. Shows up, my man shows the fuck up, and he yes. launches a fucking missile. Looking, looking like a fucking yeah. like Romulan bridge deck at this point. Like there's <laughs> fucking <laughs> green and red lights being cast everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. And so together, the t- the two groups bisexual to... lighting Captain Scars launches the fucking missile, and then and then Jack Ryan gets to live his wettest dream, yes. where yes. Captain Ramius like says, "Could you please like drive the submarine for me?" Yes. Yes, it's. Can you please really be in the military for real? Because you're you're cool enough in your heart. Again, I I could have written this anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we get this sort of like a sort of credulity stretching scene of Americans knowing how to drive a Russian submarine. I read it in a Russian translation of your manual three years ago. Uh, that's right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they they evade the torpedo that uh, that Steph- Stellan Skarsgård fires at them. But at this point, fucking Cook's assistant third class touching Grassinoff 
That's right, baby. <laughs> I knew it was this guy. Back, baby. That's right. I want to be. F- I want to fucking put my credentials on the goddamn line here, as I knew it was that fucking guy. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. he gives that suspicious oh, look during the key exchange in the beginning, and this mm. is just another example of this film. Like, you know, I hate to make the cliche comparison, but one film that comes to mind is Children of Men, in the sense of like, if a detail occurs, that detail is relevant. Mm-hmm. And like, oh, I yeah, really 100%. appreciate that. Like, it's not a storytelling technique that works for everything, but for films like this, it absolutely does. Just like you said, Devin, I was cheering like the fucking like the Pacers had actually won against the Lakers in 2000 when <laughs> they brought the rescue sub thing, like the the, the, yeah. the like boarding yeah. vehicle, because it's just like, ah, you've thought this through and like we didn't learn about this thing for no reason. It's relevant, but you don't necessarily see the plot lining up to mm. use it. And so yeah, I'm just the- like, that's so well done. Yeah, when when the cook's assistant, because he was the he's the only fucker in that cast on that ship who is wearing a fully white uniform, so you mm-hmm. can see him in the background of a bunch of scenes, and I'm like, you piece of shit, uh, I yeah. fucking know you. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, you. Yeah. There's like the the moment I noticed it was he was actually they cut to the inside of it and he's just leaving the room it's just the back of him but i was like you it's you cunt it's you yeah, fuck this you. guy this guy this guy he's this a guy. saboteur yes absolutely and he we shoots got him. sam neil he he deprives sam neil of his cottage core dreams of mm-hmm. having a round american wife and i will live in my town and i will marry a round american woman and raise rabbits and she will cook them uh, but yeah. he 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 shoots him in the chest, and Sam Neil is just like I would have liked to have seen Montana as he's dying, and I'm just like, oh mm. fuck, shit, dude. I was like, thank God yeah. you didn't have to see Montana, man. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Out of everywhere. Yeah. I don't so, know if it's going to compare very favorably to New Zealand, Sam. All right, you don't know what you're <laughs> yeah. losing out on. <laughs> I've always wanted to see a really like flat grassland. Um, mm. My dream was to retire. To Indiana. No. <laughs> no, man. I'm sorry. This is, I, 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 this is for the did best. They, did, they, did they let just anyone live in Indianapolis? <laughs> <laughs> At least I got to be in The Omen 3. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Neill going to Indiana heaven, and it's like he, he looks down and sees that he's wearing a Motorola StarTac and a belt holster. <laughs> Merging exactly. across <laughs> 60 lanes of traffic <laughs> to get into the parking lot of an Apple uh, I was going to say a fucking Bob Evans, exactly. He's just like, he's like they put, rock. They, the, the biscuits are already moist, but they put the gravy on top of them for some reason. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the saboteur is going to blow up one of the nuclear weapons in order to destroy the Red October because uh, he's such a dedicated communist that he wants to stop the Americans from getting uh, their hands on it. That's right. Uh, and mm-hmm. frankly, we support him. Uh, he right. is correct. We support him in his struggle to uh, prevent the Americans from stealing the property of that's, the people of the Soviet that's, Union. That's exactly uh, but correct. The traitor Ramius and, like, uh, and there's a the- bit in this, right? Like w- both when Ramius ic- tries to explain his reasons for defecting, and also in the briefing to the Joint Chiefs and the National Security Advisor, where they talk about this submarine being a first strike weapon like it's inherently yeah. dangerous because yeah. it has the capability to launch a nuclear war to start a nuclear war with no warning and like that's what a ballistic missile submarine is that's what yeah. it's for there aren't any harmless the, ones. the US <laughs> navy operates many of these at the time mm-hmm. this is made yeah you're just mad because it's better yeah, but yeah. we get we jealousy is a disease. Get get well, well, get well soon, bitch. bitch. Sucker, <laughs> <laughs> uh, We get we get the, uh, a simultaneous gun. Just drop the hard base. Yes, please. Put <laughs> uh, it in here. Yeah. Simultaneous gunfight and torpedo dogfight, uh, mm-hmm. uh, which is good. Uh, he said. He, he, Sean Connery doesn't actually say the line I always thought he did. Some things in here don't react well to bullets. He says, yes, he does. No, he says, most things in here don't react ah, well to bullets. Yeah. And the guy who says, some things in here is fucking Jack Ryan it's doing Sean Baldwin. Connery voice. Yeah, yes. it's quite yes. funny. It's like, beam me up, Scotty. I've been misremembering it all these years. Yeah. Alec Baldwin brackets Sean Connery voice. Some things in here don't respond well to <laughs> you, you shifted into a different reality, Alice. It, it, it wasn't just that you that you had yeah, a Mandela yeah, effect. Yeah. <laughs> you actually shifted. That's right. Uh, 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 that so, happens. Yeah, so Jack Ryan outwits and kills the, the GRU guy who was about to blow up the boat. 
Uh, Ramius like directs fuck the, the the fucking boat in such a way that the Conovalov blows itself up with its own torpedo. And the Dallas helps, yeah. Yes, uh, and sort of as we we see Doctor Petrov and the crew watching on the surface, and as they you know see it explode, uh, and they're sort of you know they all take and off their caps, yeah, yeah, because mm. yeah. they don't they don't know that they that uh, Skarsgård is there. Of course, they just think it's the Red yeah. October. They're the, like, the, oh, they're 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 fighting back against the Americans, and then they're like, oh, yeah, they they, they think that he has died heroically. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that that that's how the Soviets leave things, uh, mm -hmm. and we we end on Ryan and Ramius uh, sort of floating this submarine up a river in Maine uh, in front of a very bad blue screen. Yes, yeah, terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, where they just where they talk about fishing and how uh, the rivers yeah. in in Lithuania are very similar to the rivers in Maine. And Connery has the line: "A little revolution now and then is a healthy thing." Don't you think? Interesting. <laughs> Which I think is quite funny. And fun. then finally, he's sleeping on the plane as the credits roll yes. for the first time, yeah. and he's got a yeah, yeah. seat for the bear that he has bought for his daughter that he promised he would. It's very sweet. Yeah. So that that that's good. that's the plot of this movie. But I'm sort of like more interested in what we can say about the ideology of this movie, right? Because it's. At the time that this was made, Tom Clancy had not become this sort of like uh, mm. huge the sort brand. of household name joke. Yes. That, that he is at the mm. moment. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. It's it, it, it's interesting, right? Like it's a profoundly uh, sort of like uh, American nationalist kind of like film, but also mm -hmm. in a way that's like. Uh, that sort of like '90s aspiration, where it's like, er, like good people the world over have an American inside them trying to get out. Yeah, right? that's 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 the yeah. best way of phrasing the thing that I said earlier. I think Alice, where I said that like the singularity of him as this leader of men is the stuff that the film basically indicates makes him more like an American. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I yeah, I do think definitely. that's exactly yeah. You're right. There is definitely ideology there at, at work, and also I think that. There is obviously a little bit of, I'm not going to call it magical realism, but there is some something of the fantastic in the sense that like he's never really contradicted. No. He's right. He's always mm -hmm. right. Like he's got it and he's made it harder for himself. He's done it on God mode for some reason. <laughs> and yet like he, he's still always right. And And so, yeah, there is this, I don't know, it kind of, it propels it into this almost like mythically moral mission that he's on. Mm. Mm. Yeah. In, in order to like, Get as many people to Montana and round wives as, as he can. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny to me, too, because um, I was trying to recall what did I remember from this film from the first. I have seen it again as an adult, but it was a long time ago. Uh, and I didn't really, I mean, I know the plot, but I didn't really remember any details. And I was like, I remember the choking scene from when I was a kid. I remember the mouth moving thing, like when they changed language from when I was an adult. And then hilariously, the only thing I remember about this film from when I was seeing it the first time as a kid was that there was one scene that was really bright before the scene got dark again on the river thing with the fake blue screen. And I remember yes. I was wearing a sweatshirt with a shark on it that had glow in the dark teeth. And I was like, I was like, oh, my shirt's glowing because the light made the glow <laughs> thing. That's literally all I remember because my dad, well, army officer at the time, he, we were stationed in Rhode Island, so like surrounded by boats, was like, you would be a great film to take my five and seven year old sons to go see The Hunt for Fucking Red October. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't, I didn't really recall it at all. And so in a way, like I had this kind of fondness for it without really appreciating, call it the storytelling devices of it. Yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I was talking about this before we started recording. I woke Cynthia up because I was cheering and hooting and hollering like an ape because I was so satisfied with how <laughs> it resolved the plot. And like, I'm willing right? to forgive a lot of the sort of late Cold War, end of Cold War ideology in the film just because it's such a well-paced, well yeah. kind of brought and together story. You know what's funny? It makes... Uh, it makes Bond movies seem worse in comparison. Yes, it so yes, does. Yes, it does. Like having having this break because, like, uh, you know, this this podcast taking up so much of my movie watching means I don't get to watch a lot of like different movies now. I mostly watch movies for this, and so I've been mm. on a sort of like immersion language course in James Bond for so long that having sort of resurfaced with this with a like a a good action movie. Uh, mm. I'm just like, 
oh, that's that's how you can film like ten yeah, stuff you underwater, yeah. right? Uh, and not yeah. just having like two guys in wetsuits slowly hit each other. Um, well, it was weird to me because the thing that came to mind was uh, I was thinking about how you stack this up to other submarine movies that have been made because obviously it is kind of a genre and the, the claustrophobia hmm. and the sort of protagonist antagonist relationship in this confined space. The only film that I have ever seen that I feel like gets the vibe right in terms of sort of like the stakes is the 1995 Gene Hackman, Denzel Washington film Crimson Tide. Ooh. And once mm. again, the thought that basically like what happens on this boat determines whether or not there's a nuclear war and we cannot contact it. You know, like we can't we can't uh, mm -hmm. figure out whether or not th what, what decision they're going to make. And so I, I realized like I think the isolation, I think like the mechanic, like the, the, the ever present danger. And I think specifically the mechanical limitations of what they can and cannot know because of like mm -hmm. where they are in the water, their depth in the water yeah. or like the radios and stuff like the, 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 the lag between information being available at high levels to down to them, even just getting to the Dallas on a helicopter where you, it's like, oh, uh, here's a grid square of water, go to water and maybe you'll find well, a there's, boat. Mm -hmm. There's even like a sort of like a more tame example of this in the beginning, which is in order to show some photographs to James Earl Jones, uh, Jack Ryan has to put them in his briefcase and physically travel from London to yeah. Virginia yes. uh, in order to do this. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a long sort of latency. Uh, yes. mm -hmm. When he's like briefing the Joint Chiefs, he's talking about Ramius and he's like, Do we have a picture of him that we can like put on the overhead projector yeah. that I brought with mm -hmm. me? Oh, fuck yeah, yeah, this is just like full on analog tech wet dream. Like, it's so cool. Yeah. I mean, mm. if you if you're a fan of that sort of thing, like also something that I found really funny is that the actor who plays um, Captain Mancuso is the same guy who's like one of the FBI people in The Silence of the Lambs. Oh yeah, and there is a weird kind of aesthetic mm. crossover there. I think in terms of just sort of the grayness, the drabness, the the and the intensity and the sort of like feeling of isolation. It's and, it's something that like Manhunter did very very well more recently, and looking back to those same things. And so in a way, like, I just think this is such a singular film. And even though like the Jack Ryan franchise has gone on to become more absurd, and obviously it's been done in many similarly good, but in oftentimes much worse ways, I think that like, you're just so along for the ride. And when you perceive this, not as like the cliche of all the Tom Clancy novels and the Netflix series where they go and they, they, they defeat the villain, Vincent and Maduro, like, but when they actually <laughs> like in this initial incarnation, like treat this like a story you're coming into. So the first time this character whose name you don't know, like he's just a guy, like you are so along for the ride of it. And I think that like, it deprived of that mythical status of him as sort of like the guy who was both James Bond and the future president, just as like a 35 year odd year old, you know, CIA analyst with like a thwarted military career. You, you absolutely, you, you, you get into it and you don't, if you came into this blind, you don't presume that this guy is magical or that he's going to be able to have mm. all the answers. He's just sort of like putting himself out there to get fucking rained on. And like, you just, you, I don't know, like it's compelling. Hmm. Yeah. What is interesting is that um, unlike perhaps uh, later or more recent adaptations of Tom Clancy, the communist characters in this are by and large not portrayed as evil. The only one who's like a really a bad guy is Stellan Skarsgård and he's a bad guy because he's like arrogant. That's mm, that's yeah, his flaw. Yes. Whereas like, it, you know, if, if this was a later thing, you might have the scene where all the men burst into song singing the US our national anthem. You might like show like somebody with a gun making them do it. But what's interesting is like in this, that's like completely sincere in this. Like, it's a, it's yeah. a little mm -hmm. bit like For Your Eyes Only in that it does have detente, right? It's yeah. Yeah. like both sides of the Cold War. Well, we're only seeing one side, but like the Western side of the Cold War has sort of like come to terms with it in a way mm. that is like surprisingly healthy and this this will not persist like within a year yeah. of this movie coming out the, the soviet union will not be a state anymore yeah um, but also think yeah. about how this era is portrayed in for example call of duty games versus this this is so much more yes. humane yes. but also like in a way sed not i want to say sedate but subdued like, professional would be yeah, the word I would yeah, use. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way. Yeah, exactly. Like, even when, when Ramus is, like, addressing his crew, he tells them, like, uh, your fathers have done this, your older brothers have done this. This is, mm. like, a, a sort of a generational, uh, a, a generational struggle. 
Uh, and I, I had some quite, um, it's almost like sad, well, I'm going to use the word, uh, hauntological feelings hmm. watching this film because you're right, Nate, that like the Soviet Union is so often portrayed in more modern things as like evil and repressive. And we do get some stuff like that with like Comrade Putin and stuff. But um, I, I felt like almost a little bit sad and nostalgic watching this because like this film portrays the Soviet Union, which no longer exists. And like we we have joked on this podcast before about like you know we uncritically support the Soviet Union and stuff, yes. but um, yeah, the I fact joked. of the matter That's is right. that like especially in the UK there are a lot of trans people who are not only communists but who also like very much enjoy the aesthetic of the Soviet Union. Like mm-hmm. there's a recurring like drop on trash feature where they like where you guys mm. play the, the yeah, US if, song only, if only I could play it for you now. <laughs> yeah, and it, it just it occurred to me that like. We are seeing through a a, a door uh, in time, which is a thing with you know stuff on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, we are seeing kind of the last time that humanity really tried to organize political economy differently. Um, that we are really mm-hmm. like seeing a world that obviously like wasn't perfect and it wasn't a great place to live and like had all kinds of really bad problems. Um, but it's kind of the last time we really tried to do anything differently. And I think that as trans people and especially and not just trans people, also like people under the age of 50 who like in this country are extremely disenfranchised. There is something, there's like a strong feeling I get from seeing this, this world. Um, it just kind of made me really sad in a way, in a way that I struggled to articulate and explain. If, um, if, if you don't mind a bit of intertextuality here, mm. um, mm-hmm. w- we saw the movie Strange Days on Trash Future recently. And w- mm-hmm. which is set in a dystopian future of 1999. And one of the characters in Strange Days says that like the reason why he's pessimistic about the, the, like, the next millennium is that we have tried every form of government and they've all been seen to fail. So mm-hmm. I-, I was thinking about this too, that I can only think of the Americans and Chernobyl in mm-hmm. terms of recent works of art that have portrayed, you know, for mass entertainment that have portrayed the Soviet Union in a not like comical way. Like they're not, Mm -hmm. I mean, Chernobyl obviously like goes above and beyond to be like, have you heard about this system, which is bad, but like there's Mm -hmm. just in like the sympathy with which it really tries to capture the material culture of the Soviet Union. Like there's so much to it that it just at least tries to be more nuanced than like, you know, Tim Curry's outtakes from Command and Conquer kind of shit. And <laughs> the point I'm making here is that like it, it this is different because it's it's made in the Cold War. It was set earlier in the Cold War, written or in that time period, but also like it's kind of representing an adversary that exists that is like both feared and estimable as opposed to like a caricature of the past. Mm. If that makes mm. sense. Yeah, and even and- even Tom Clancy would not write other adversaries this way. Um, mm. Like I, he he wrote Japan this way when he wrote Death of Honor, the novel in which he predicted nine eleven. But once uh, once terrorism sort of crept into his psyche, he was like, uh, "No, this is like something that has to be like humiliated." Yeah, as opposed yeah. to well, as opposed to the Soviet Union. Can I can I throw something in really quick? Uh, yeah, I don't course. know if you're familiar with. Um, so Mark Bowden wrote the book Black Hawk Down that got made into uh, the film. And, you know, he was a journalist, I think, for the Philadelphia Inquirer. He wrote this long series about what had happened in Mogadishu and then it made the book. And then he also wrote a book called Guests of the Ayatollah, which is about the uh, Iranian, uh, the Tehran embassy hostage situation. And I had to put it down in like the first, you know, 30 pages. And I loved Black Hawk Down for better or worse. But the reason is, is because so many people, when they confront a political ideology like Islamism, they cannot empathize with people choosing it. And so Mm. they have to almost write like fucking, you know, the mad Arab wazir Abdul Hazarid from fucking uh, HP Lovecraft or (laughs) like Jafar from Disney's (laughs) Aladdin level of comical evil to conceive of this. And it's like, it's 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 nice to watch something where like it's con- like it's adversarial but it's done in a way that seeks to represent reality to some mm-hmm. degree yeah. as opposed to representing like the darkest fears I'm, I'm trying to think about if i've seen any movies that do represent islamism in a in that sort of way and the only one i can come up with off the top of my head is another future bonus episode syriana uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I, I, I guess to me, it's it's just 
I appreciate the fact that this, as a historical document as well as a fictional story, captures something uh, where it was it's drawn in opposition to sort of the home team, mm. but mm-hmm. it's done in such a way that doesn't play upon the sort of like, oh, well, we all know what happens next. And I'm going to throw in one other comparison, which is it was a nice little detail. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read Stephen King's novel, 112263. Yes. Like, it's good. I love it. It's really good. Like Stephen King, for his myriad faults, does some things very well. And that book's incredible. But mm-hmm. there's one detail in there that I really appreciated, which is that in one of the, spoiler alert, in one of the past, like iterations of him reliving the past, trying to get to the conclusion he wants to, where he can save JFK, uh, the protagonist is in a relationship with a woman who attempts suicide during the Cuban Missile Crisis because many people in America did because because they thought they yeah. were going to die. And that's the thing is that the Cuban Missile Crisis now is invoked as the symbol of like, oh, this point we got to. And it's like, good thing we backed off. But in the fog of the present, people thought they were going to die in a nuclear war. And mm-hmm. many people thought it's better for me to kill myself than to die in a ho- nuclear holocaust. And so yeah. that's the kind of thing mm-hmm. like that. Like this is a portrayal that's that similarly draws upon the kind of fog of the present, even if it is, you know, super sympathetic to the Western side and to NATO and to the military. It's still has to engage with the Soviet Union as a thing that exists, not a thing that like mm-hmm. it, the writer's ideological conception of it in the past, you know, becomes. Mm. Yeah. I think another major part of it is that the the Cold War is, in my estimates, the last war that's ever happened. Because t- to me, in order for something to be a war, there has to be something of a reasonable shot at either side winning. It has to be a if, it, if it's only one like side is ever possibly going to win. Then that's a genocide. conflict. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and the the United States won that war in the same manner that they won the Vietnam War. Um, because guess who the fucking global hegemon is? Mm. It's not Vietnam. Mm-hmm. It's not the Soviet Union. Even if you get embarrassed militarily, which the U.S. did in in Vietnam, mm. it's still pretty difficult to say that in any way America was embarrassed or stopped by this but Mm -hmm. the cold war was between two nations of a roughly equivalent size and even if there was no actual like ground fighting it's not like you can say that any wars have happened since then yeah i mean we have gone to war in the middle east but i don't remember any countries in the middle east airdropping troops into the uk Mm. we've done that to Mm -hmm. them but that hasn't happened back to us it's harder to make this kind of movie about that because you don't have to treat any nations in the Middle East with the same sort of respect that you would treat the Soviet Union yeah. as yeah. a legitimate threat to the West. You you could make the argument that there hasn't been a war movie made recently because there hasn't been like the kind of war that we make movies about. Well, yeah. And I was going to raise that point no. that the largest ground conflict since World War II is the Second Congo War. And just even finding people in sort of like who talk about war professionally, you know, in any capacity to acknowledge that is so difficult because yeah. once, like you said, it, because it's not seen as a clash of ideology, it's just seen as a regional conflict, despite it having, you know, like not quite Kursk style battles of tanks, but full on like huge engagements, mm. huge numbers of troops involved, huge numbers of casualties. But it, it is, it is basically treated as a thing that only like the senior, senior international affairs heads need even be aware of, mm. as opposed to like you were saying this, this sort of battle between ideologies that is treated as uh, like a war that everyone has to consider themselves on a side of, you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. And that, mm. that this, this is kind of a document of that. And there are traces of that in, say, for example, the most recent uh, version of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, in the way that like Soviet espionage abroad is represented in things along those lines, like the stakes involved. But for this, like, kind of like, what if the Cold War goes hot? Like, seeing it portrayed not through like this nostalgic lens, but rather as a fictional vehicle to address contemporary anxiety, it's just so different to mm. me. You know what it is? Mm. What we think of as war movies now. Like, say, I don't know, American Sniper, 12 Strong, whatever. Yeah, that was the, the one the, I was thinking those, of. Those, <laughs> those, don't, those aren't war movies in the like genre that we've typically defined it. I think they're closer to cop movies. And I'll explain mm. that. Because <laughs> a cop movie doesn't have an adversary that is legitimized in any way. Uh, yeah. The, the protagonist's 
being yeah. in a situation is never questioned. Their rightness is not questioned because it's like institutionally bestowed upon them. And you're mm. meant to, when there is a hostile action taken against them, you are meant to feel uh, shock and uh, like discord and revulsion. Whereas mm -hmm. in your more trad war movies, even the sort of like apocalypse now war as hell thing, right? You kind of get the the feeling that like it's all in the game, right? It's all legitimate. There's uh, you know, it, apocalypse now makes that uh explicit because uh you have like sort of uh Vietnamese civilians throwing grenades onto helicopters and then being killed, and the Americans who have been bombing their village. Uh, you know, being being disgusted, but like highlighting that hypocrisy that was in the genre, but it's not there now. That's just gone. Mm. It's entirely, no. as as you said, Devin, asymmetric. Mm -hmm. And and if I could have any sort of final thoughts on on this concept of there having been no war since the Cold War, mm. um, and that the entire war on terror has been essentially just a vehicle to continue. Oh. American hegemony. Bear, bear in mind I would that, the, quote, uh, that um... I, I would quote a great man, Bernard Sanders, when he said, listen up, pal, America deserved 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did have a serious point there, which is... Yeah, you can make that if you'd like. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what you know, um, uh, they, they called formally the UN um, involvement in the Korean War? Was a police action. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, the world police. Yeah. It's 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 all cop movies. It's cop movies. James Bond is a cop. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're a stupid what policeman. What does this tell us about masculinity? This is analysis, baby. This e is what you e pay ev everything. For. Everything yeah. after a bridge too far is cops. Will not elaborate. <laughs> logging off. Thank you for listening. Reject modernity. <laughs> Embrace traditions. The, 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 Truly, we are all Comrade Loganoff. I was going to say, Comrade um, Loganoff, connect those fucking wires and end this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Nate, where Thanks can the on. people find you? Uh, oh. you, can, you can find me on Twitter at In These Deserts. And uh, I am the producer of Kill James Bond. I'm also a co host of uh, the Trash Future podcast and um, the What a Hell of a Way to Die podcast. So if you're interested in leftist takes on the military, veterans, issues, et cetera, Hell of a Way is your, is your bag. And if you just want uh, uh, dy dystopia laughs, I'm on Trash Future as well. And thank you very much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, been, it's been truly wonderful. And here's something I've forgotten to ever actually mention on a recording, but I, Devon, am the producer of the podcast 10,000 Posts with uh, Hussein Kasvani and Phoebe Roy, which you can find at 10K Posts, and it's right. extremely good. Y you know what? Also, I do a podcast called... Uh, yeah! <laughs> well, there's your problem. Uh, Abigail, you should really get a side gig. It's weird that you're only doing this this podcast. Yeah, yeah. I should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You thought about getting like a like a, a TikTok or something? There are actually some people who like listen to this and then found Philosophy Tube. So like shout out to like those people. You, you guys rule. Uh, <laughs> do if you have not watched my YouTube channel, you should do that. And you should also really just good. like uh, you should buy a television and start and like start watching TV shows in preparation for next year because I'm gonna be in some. This has been, be been bad Kill Bond. James Bond. Thank you for listening. Our next bonus episode is I don't know what it's going to be, but a future bonus episode will be another Jack Ryan canon. It will be Patriot Games at some point, and we'll get Nate back on. Mm. Oh yeah, I am turn, stoked, it? super stoked. All right, well, thanks for listening. Theme song. Theme song. Theme song. Credits roll. See you later, baby. Mwah. Thank you for listening to yet another episode of Kill James Bond. If you happen to be a police person, I did not mean that final remark. That was a joke that I was doing as a joke. Tune in next week for our License to Kill episode on the free feed. A rip-roaring 80s action film of revenge that just kind of happens to star a guy whose name is James Bond. Not really a Bond film in any meaningful sense. Uh, <laughs> and the week after that is our next bonus episode. The movie is Spy Kids 2. And we have a guest, the wonderful Australian comedian Tom Walker. Um, and that will be a lot of fun. 
So thank you so much for being a Patreon supporter of the show, but a special thanks, as always, to our £15 and above patrons, and those are Jack Holmes, Paint McCalla, George Rohak, Thomas Overhart, Amanda Rugged, Sol, Lockheed Martin, thank you very much to our friends at Lockheed Martin, Nikki, Carolyn Tankersley, Ben O'Rice, Jay Martindale, Amber DeGrazia, Pete Snorrison, Field Commissar, Jen Jen, Jack Bushel, Mothman, Big Titty Goth Girl, Tarp O, Trip, Timothy Bajorni, Holiday, Larrikins, Kit Divine, Sydney Steckle, Kentucky Fried Commie, Zoe Shepard, Elizabeth Cox, Alfredo, Jonah Schwamberger, Ryle Leal, David Wick Ramaratna, Richard Drum, James Knapman, Robbie Morgan, Kinney 92, Josh Simmons, Millie, and Avery Darling. This has been Kill James Bond, starring, as always, Alice, Abigail, and Devon. Our guest, and indeed our producer this week, was Nate Bethay, and the links to all of his various accoutrements will be in the description. Our podcast art is by Maddie Lubchansky, and our website is by Tom Allen. See ya.